yeah, Baruch Zez to Armenian University in Armenia, to who, who generously hosting his, this talk. Thank you very much. And also many greetings to Yerevan in Armenia, a place I like very much, also because my partner is Armenian. I have been several times in your beautiful country. So thank you very much for hosting. So I'm talking, I'm Georg Nordhoff, I'm talking about a uh, issue which touches our daily life more and more. Just recently, a chat GPT has been introduced. My students actually often use it to improve their English and then to co correct their supervisor's English. Um, and so my topic is, do robots, artificial intelligence have consciousness, a view from the brain? And I do think that there are some lessons we can learn from the brain. So that's why I asked, basically, you see here in the lower part of my talk, how does the brain do it? Lessons for artificial intelligence. So the thousand dollar question is, of course, what is consciousness? Oh. Nobody knows, everybody knows, everybody experiences this. But if you ask 10 people, you probably get 20 opinions. So I point out two features of consciousness here, which are key. First person perspective and point of view. What on earth are these strange terms? So first, we have a first, our brain endows us with the first person perspective. So I look into the Zoom, the Zoom is part of a wider room and the room I can look out of the windows is part of the wider room. So I have a certain center, a certain perspective, a third person, person perspective which is unique to me, you have a different first person perspective. So we have a perspective view on the world, but at the same time being located. Perspective view from within the world. How is that possible? So the key thing is, philosophers have discussed it, that we have a point of view. What on earth is a point of view? Imagine, you're going to Yerevan onto the hills, let's say where Mother Armenia stands. And you have a point of view over all Yerevan. It's a beautiful view. You look into the valley, you see the city. Now, now you go down, you go down to Northern Avenue, uh, let's say to the opera, and you have a completely different point of view. So now you see the hills up there, but you, Maybe you see the Mother Armenia, but not as clear, but you do not see the rest of the center. You have a point of view. And what is important that the point of view anchors us in a wider context here in the world. Your point of view is not within the brain itself. Your point of view is between you and the environmental context. Yeah, so a point of view anchors us and our body in the world, we become part of the world and can develop a perspective view on the world. That is key for consciousness. And I will tell you how that is generated. So the question is, the point of view provides our interface and our location within the world. But what makes this interface possible. That leads to the key topic of my talk, time scale. Basically, if you have no time and say, oh God, this not off, it's really boring, you can basically turn off and say, I got the message, it's just about time scale. However, in the following of my talk, I want to explain a little bit and give you examples why time, what time scales are and why they are important. And as I like to always bring examples from nature, yeah, and one typical example is the iceberg. The current neuroscience of the view uh, of the brain and a lot of artificial intelligence too, just operates at the surface of the iceberg. However, we all know that an iceberg has a deeper layer, a deeper layer beneath the water. And that provides the interface and the stability of the iceberg. It locates us in the, it locates the iceberg in the ocean, but at the same time, it distinguishes the iceberg from the ocean. So that's exactly the interface. And this deeper layer is 
T for the brain, T for consciousness. And my claim is that current artificial intelligence did not yet really exploit this deeper layer. Where, the, where we are, where the artificial agent needs to be aligned to the environmental context in an adaptive way. And the argument is that this deeper layer, where you have this alignment between the iceberg and the water or between us and the world slash the point of view, that is about different timescales. Now, what do I mean by timescales? I will further elaborate in my talk. Here, I just want to say that this timescales are very important in sort of matching between your brain body and the environment. I know this is a very complex uh, picture, but what is important here, you have a continuous matching. For instance, what do I mean by matching? Uh, when you, I make certain movements and maybe you try to match your movement you, uh, with my movement. So you align your movements to my movements. Bad example, I know. Consider music when you're dancing. Then you try to match your inner rhythm with the rhythm of the music. So now you tap your, your legs and your arms according to the rhythm of the music. So you match with the music. Gerg, most, Gerg excuse me, you can see uh, the slides. We we only we see the, the first one still. I don't know that I don't know I don't know how this works. Um, and maybe you can reshare again. I'm sorry. Maybe you can reshare again the screen so it works. Okay. Mm -hmm. Can you see the time slides now? Yes. yes, no, no, yes. it's good. Yeah, okay, let me see when I push on the next one whether you see the next one. Yeah, so the matching is so when you listen to music and you dance to music, you continuously try to match your inner rhythm to the rhythm of the music. And that's a pure statistical process, stochastic matching. Bruce West, one of the key people of the dynamic system theory, calls it complexity matching. And this is what I try to indicate here. And for that matching, the time scales are key. So you need to have, and as we all know, in the environment, you have a large repertoire of time scales, and that the brain tries to match its own repertoire of time scales. And I will elaborate. Now let me know. Can you see the next slide now? Yes, Gerd. Perfect. The window. Okay. So, as you know, I like to do analogous comparisons. The window. So look out the window. So here you see a window, a large window, and smaller windows. When you just look through one of these very small windows, you just see a little branch and maybe some leaves. So you don't really know, is this a tree, is this a bush, or something. Then let's say you look at the six smaller windows together on the left, Ah, you see, you 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 see the branches um, and the trunk, but maybe you don't see all the leaves. So you don't really know whether it's winter, and the winter in Canada here can last very long, as we all know, six months, or whether it's spring with some emerging leaves, or it's summer, and so forth. And now you see, when you just see on the left, you see maybe that's a single single tree. But now when you take all the big window together, you see it's a whole. Uh, forest. So meaning different window sizes allow one to see different features in the outside world. It's a continuous zoom in and zoom out. Actually, we are in zoom, so you can follow that. And exactly now, the time scales with the brain. The brain, imagine the time scales like temple windows. You have presented up here a repertoire of different time scales uh, temple windows, short and long. So it's a repertoire of different time scales. And it will turn out the more time scales you have, different time scales, the better you can align and interface with the environmental context. That means if you have more different window sizes in your living room, 
you can better zoom in and zoom out and you see more details of what is out there. And exactly the same with the brain. And interestingly, in the brain, you see here in the lower, you have sort of a gradient from shorter to longer temple windows or time scales. So the shorter time scales, the shorter temple windows allow you to zoom in, to see the details, to see the single finger, maybe even if you had a very uh, a short window here, even to see my fingernail. Now, if, and that's basically in the back of your brain, like for instance, in the visual regions of your brain. However, then when you move forward to the uh, upper, uh, for the anterior part here, where I now do this, that's where you have longer time scales. Yeah, that's where you don't see the single fingernail anymore, but you see the whole person. Aha, it's a hand. Aha, it's a hand uh, of a person. Aha, it's a hand of Georg. So, and that's so you have to imagine just like the situation in the living room. So basically through our brain and its time scales, we perceive the outside world in different features, smaller features, larger features, zoom in, zoom out. And the brain has a larger repertoire of time scales. It's quite amazing. And we haven't really understood how the brain yields this uh, large repertoire of time scales and that makes the brain so adaptive to different contexts, which again can be characterized by different time scales. So now you say, what are the time scales of the brain good for? And I think I already indicated then, and we introduced the concept of temporal spatial alignment, which is sort of, it's, they allow aligning to your environmental context. Remember my example of music, um, is exactly that. So you align your own inner rhythm to the rhythm of the music. And most important, that gives you a feeling of groove. It gives you a feeling of synchrony and you feel good. Yeah. So you extend your own self in a virtual way to the music. You are part of the music. And that's exactly what many artists tell me. My partner is a composer, so we have a lot of musicians in our circles, and that's exactly what they tell me. When they really become part of the music, then they feel the groove and they play very well. And what I want to uh, point out with this uh, figure here, which was done by Philip Kla, who always, uh, one a very clever guy in my group who does always beautiful figures, and you can see, I think that speaks for itself, and you can see what is important, that you, the brain has an active mechanism. It does not just passively receive the input, but it tries to actively align and synchronize with the input. And I'm sure that when I do these kind of movements, that maybe your brain tries to get in synchrony with that. And by that, it may be able to decipher the meaning of what I try to desperately convey. Yeah, so this is probably, that's why uh, Philip made this arrow from the brain to the world. So the brain by actively aligning to the world becomes basically part of the world. And that provides your point of view and that is key consciousness. Now, that's exactly what I want to point out. Now I give you some examples how the time scales are important for distinct aspects of consciousness. The Brian's time scales provides the temple windows for consciousness. Again, so this is a, an investigation which we did in uh, patients who lost consciousness in different states. For instance, in sleep. When you fall asleep, uh, you gradually lose your consciousness. Now you want to know what happens with the time scale. If not of is right, then also your time scales should get changed when you lose consciousness during the gradual sleep stages. And that is exactly what we observed. So this was done by Federico Cilio in, in Italy. Actually, he's both a philosopher and an excellent neuroscientist, which is very nice. And for instance, what you can see, you measure the time scales more for the experts, the engineers, for instance, here with what is called the autocorrelation window. And it's basically literally see a temple window by means of which the brain can adapt or align to corresponding temple windows in the environment. 
So it's a matching process. Now, in the sleep, what Federico could observe, this is EEG, uh, that your time scales become abnormally long. So you lose the shorter time scales and only the long time scales. So you cannot zoom in anymore. So you do not see the details anymore and the fine grained, the smaller temple windows completely disappear. You can see this here, your time scales measured by the autocorrelation window becomes longer and longer during the different sleep stages. Interestingly, in the REM sleep, which is typical for dream, they sort of revert to somewhat a normal feature. That's maybe why we can have consciousness in dreams. Now, let me proceed. So important, when you lose the faster time scales or when your brain becomes abnormally slow, slower frequency shift towards slower frequency, you're losing consciousness, yeah? And what does this mean? That your time, your temporal complexity becomes minimized and you lose the different layers of the temporal windows. And when your consciousness also includes different time scales, very fast, you can follow this one. At the same time, it is longer time scale because you perceive the continuity that here Georg Nord of the same person is sitting here and talking and talking and talking. Yeah, so you have shorter and longer times. Now, if you lose the shorter time scale, you will not be able to perceive these faster movements anymore. Yeah, and when you become longer and longer, then also it becomes more and more static. Yeah, so you will not be able to perceive these movements anymore. Yeah, and then ultimately, and this is indicated by here, I know this is a complex figure. This is, a, uh, this is done by Federico, also very nice uh, figure. So when you have, uh, for instance, here, he had this uh, situation uh, with a police, uh, with a thief and a policeman. Here's a thief, here's a policeman, and they speak, "Police, stop, stop right now! Uh, uh, you'll never reach me." So you see, you need shorter time scale to pick up each word. You need also the slightly longer time scale to make the connection from "police, stop," and "stop right now," and you need very long time scale to put everything together. Now, if you're losing the faster time scales, your picture becomes more blurry, yeah? Because you cannot distinguish the details anymore. Here's a speech. Now it becomes even longer. And now if you lose the faster completely, you have only one long, everything is completely black. That's exactly what happens when you gradually lose consciousness. And I think that goes very well with your perception. Now, I give you another example of how the time scales impact consciousness. The brain time scales follow and actively align to the time scales of the environment. I already mentioned the synchrony, and that's key. This alignment is key for consciousness. This, imagine here, you know, you know my preference for other examples already. Look at the surfer. Uh, so the surfer, when you ask the surfer, so I spoke with surfers, it's very, very interesting. So before they go out and swim, let's say, to the really high waves, more than uh, 10 meters, that's, a litmus, that's a, a litmus test for the professional surfer. So more than 10 meter waves, uh, they first, you see them, they observe, they, they don't, don't go right into the wave, but first they sit there with their surfboard and look at the waves. And I'm sure that in their brain, they sort of encode and follow the dynamics of the wave, and then they probably with their, so instance, their motor cortex, they simulate that dynamic of the wave. So that now that they can basically tune their movements to follow the dynamic of the waves. You see this beautiful in this picture, the guy really adapts uh, to the dynamics of the wave. And I, if I had, uh, were doing a snapshot a millisecond later, he would be in a different position, again, in order to follow the dynamics of the wave in his own movements. And the better he follows the dynamics of the wave in his own movements, the better the groove. That's what they all tell you. That's the groove of stuff. It's the same as I said with the musician, when you're completely into the rhythm of the piece, you become part of the piece and you have a fantastic feeling, a, a groove. Yeah, same here with the surface, that's what they tell me. Now, same with the brain. So this is an investigation, again, by Philip Kla, who does these wow. beautiful figures. And you can see that here, uh, he presented uh, external stimuli 
um, auditory stimuli every 20 to 30 seconds. And then he was saying, maybe your brain has in exactly the same frequency of 20 to 30 seconds, it has an increase in its activity slash its power spectrum. So in this 20 seconds, this is exactly the frequency range. You can see this here is the blue bar. And you can see really here, this is what is called a power spectrum. This is a frequency, this is a power. You can see an increase in the power of the brain in exactly the frequency range of the task stimuli. This is called task periodicity. Now, what happens when you lose consciousness in anesthesia? You see, it's completely flipped. Your brain doesn't follow anymore the external environment. It's isolated. Yeah, it's isolated. And that's why you lose consciousness, because you cannot develop a point of view anymore. And I hope that your brain now follows my movements so that you get the full meaning, the importance of this task periodicity. Yeah, and another thing more for the experts, which might be interesting, you see that the power spectrum is completely flat. There's no difference anymore between slower frequency and faster frequency. This is called white noise. And you see in the awake brain, you see the slower frequency have more power. Look at the seaside. The big waves are very powerful and that's why they are good for the surfers. When you go to Hawaii, you see these big waves, it's amazing. And the faster waves do not have as much power. So that is what is called pink noise. So you see really when you lose uh, your pink noise becomes white noise, you lose the task periodicity, you lose consciousness. Yeah. So meaning you cannot be part of the environment, you cannot align and you cannot develop a point of view anymore. So this path still is the groove of the brain, as I would say, analogous to the groove of the surface. Now, basically, what is important here, and that's a key point of the brain, and I will point that out for the artificial intelligence later. It's a combination of neural waves and world waves. I just uh, wrote a book that just came out uh, called Neural Waves, and they need to interact with the world waves. And that interaction together gives you a point of view. Look at this guy here, the surfer. Due to his brain, his neural waves, he can adapt to the waves of the seaside and that gives them a point of view and that he can use the full power of the sea wave to propel his uh, surfboard. That gives him a feeling of groove consciousness. Now, if I'm right, then you would expect if the brain has a larger dynamic repertoire, more time scales should lead to more extensive interface with the environment. And again, there's an example for that, meditation, that gives you a form of an extended consciousness. Um, I could make a what, cheese sandwich. Uh, please turn Do off I your... Can you please turn off your mic? I think we heard some uh, things you say in the background. Uh, so what happens in meditation? So this is an investigation done by uh, Austin Cooper and now it tells that I'm muted. No, no, we listen okay. to you. Okay, okay, good. So, um, so what happens in meditation? Meditation, so here, Austin Cooper and Bianca Ventura from my group investigated uh, naive versus proficient meditators. In key feature, in usual people, you have a, in your consciousness, you have a dichotomy. You have a dualism between yourself and the world. You distinguish between yourself and the other. So that's a, what is called a duality. And that duality in your consciousness stretches to your, uh, in the environment, to the body, to your own thoughts and everything. You always make a distinction between self and other. However, the proficient meditator, they don't experience this duality anymore. They don't make a distinction of their self from the environmental context. They're completely aligned to the environmental context, you see here the self as a distinction has vanished. 
So that's a, what is called the non-duality. So now, interestingly, so exactly this kind of dual versus non-dual organization of the mental side, on the mental state, you can also see in the brain. So usually the naive meditator or the common person has a dual uh, organization or dual topography in the brain. You distinguish between uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, more outer regions in the brain or called lateral regions and regions, the blue ones more in the middle of the brain. Yeah, the middle regions of the brain are located to you, associated with your sense of self. The outer regions of the brain, uh, also called the central executive network, are more associated with your, uh, with the other, with your perception and cognition of the other and the outer environment. So, and this is called the default mode network. So you have a clear dual, what is called a dual topography in your brain. However, when you look at the proficient meditators, there is no longer this principal distinction between these two regions, but they're very highly synchronized with each other. Uh, and there's basically what we described as a non-dual topography. So you see what happens on the mental level, a shift from a dual uh, mental state to a non-dual mental state also happens on the neuronal level, the shift from a dual neuronal topography organization to a non-dual topography. Now you might want to ask what happens to the time scale in these meditators. So Austin and Bianca investigated that too. And what they found that the dynamic repertoire, the repertoire of time scales, uh, largely increased doing with increasing meditation proficiency. So your dynamic repertoire, instead of five different temple <coughs> windows, you have 20 different temple windows. And that, of course, allows you to align much better with the environmental context in a much more fine-grained way. So, and then Austin added these beautiful uh, figures, which I always like. So here you have a non-dual awareness, a dual awareness, uh, um, which basically a distinction between yourself and the other, but here you completely immerse in a non-dual way in the environment. And that's exactly what these meditators, proficient meditators tell you. So meaning you have an extension of your time scales, it's also an extension of your consciousness. And that's an extension of your interface with the environment. And that's exactly what these proficient meditators tell you. Now, I finally come to the topic I should talk about, what artificial intelligence can and can't do. And I contrast that with, as you already know, what brains can and can't do. So, in human brain, the brains are remarkably adaptive. Absolutely. You can play Go, you can play chess, you can listen to music, you can make music, you can nurse a baby, you can even drive the car, even if you're as young as this one, uh, and it's not yet a self-driving car. So the time scales make our brain highly adaptive because the more time scales you have, the better you can match with a much larger repertoire of time scales in the environment that makes you adaptive. And that also provides your point of view slash consciousness. However, as we all know, we are not perfect. These different time scales make us prone to error. We are not error free. Yeah. Uh, so we are never 100%. That I call the error problem. So that can be contrasted with what is called the generalization problem in AI. And that is indeed true. So the current AI is good in one particular task. Chess Go, Chat GPT, or text, Chess Go is, uh, Go is clear. But they cannot do the other task. Particularly, they cannot do novel tasks. So meaning they are not adaptive. Yeah, they're perfect and really good in one particular task. And when you look at these problems, as BERT, for instance, natural language transformer, has a very limited number of time scales. Yeah, uh, as BERT, when you look into the exact organization, is basically three layers of implicit time scales, but not explicitly modeled as such. And that's probably why they're so good, because they have just particular time scales designed for the task, bingo. That's enough. So that makes them so good. 
but they're not confounded by the other time scales. Of course, and the more time scales, you might have a perceptual illusion if you use the wrong time scales uh, in that moment. And that's exactly what happens in humans. Because we have this large repertoire of time scales, sometimes we're using the wrong one. So we, we zoom in instead of zoom out or vice versa. Yeah, that, for instance, happens in mental disorders like schizophrenia and depression. As you know, I'm also a psychiatrist. So we all know this. Nothing is for free. When you look at biology, at evolution brain, and the same applies to artificial intelligence, nothing is for free. A large repertoire of time scale is excellent, is good for adaptation and having consciousness, but bad for error-free perfection. And you have mental disorders with people who really suffer from this lack of error-free perfection, for instance, obsessive compulsive disorder. Yeah. So there you see nothing is for free. So we need to find a balance. Now, let me go beyond the humans and then I come back to artificial intelligence and then I will come to my conclusion. So how about non-human species? Non-human species are, for instance, plants. Do plants have movement? You would say, well, the plant is just standing there. It doesn't have movement. That's not true. The plants move, but they move so slow that we cannot perceive it because we don't have that time scale. Within 24 hours, the plants move, but we cannot perceive it because our brain's time scale do not allow for the, perceiving those movements of the plants. Another beautiful example much discussed in philosophy of mind, Thomas Nagel, 1974, what is it like to be a bat? So he said, uh, the bat is a particular example which uh, can perceive ultrasonar waves, which we can't. And he says, that endows the bat with a different point of view within and towards the world when compared to the human uh, point of view. And he's right we cannot perceive ultrasonar waves. So meaning different species, different time scales, different degrees of interface with the world. And the degree of overlap between human and non-human time scales probably decides how much we can communicate. So here, this is a schematic figure uh, done by one of my former students, Meshat Golizorki, who actually was an engineer, a uh, very clever engineer. Unfortunately, now he works for the stock market industry, which I find very sad as a brain scientist, but he wanted uh, to go that way. Uh, so here he drew that different species have different timescales. And that provides you with different interfaces with the environment. Yeah, And the degree to which the timescales between different species overlap might decide upon the degree to which we can communicate. Now, the key question, can we build time scales into artificial intelligence? In principle, yes. You as engineers might say, oh, not of you're just a psychiatrist, philosopher, neuroscience. You have no idea how complicated that is. But I think that's an area where neuroscience and AI and engineers need to work together. And I'm very open to that, and you will see why. Because for me, this has important implication. So now, if we know the time scales of the brain, we, I showed you that the time scales of the brain are key for aligning, synchronizing us and the brain with the body and the environmental context. That's our interface. Like, remember the living room example, the windows of the living room are our interface with the external environment when you're in the house. Same the time scales of the brain. They are the interface, our interface through which we are connected with the outside world. Now, if we want to make that connection more specific or more focused, we might want to change, we might want to build artificial uh, agents with specific time scales. Yeah, and we indicated that, for instance, here, let's say you can build an, I know we cannot build an artificial brain, uh, the idea of a blue brain uh, by Henry Markram uh, didn't uh, go so far, as we all know in neuroscience, um, and, but you can add additional time scales. 
or you can pronounce certain time scales. You make certain time scales more specific, more fine grain, or uh, uh, enlarge them. So that, for instance, indicated here. And I think that's where beautiful, for instance, the uh, deep learning networks, the different layers, I could imagine that into these layers, I would love to build in some time scales to also to use them for better prediction of time scale data from the brain. And then of course, also for better adaptive agents. Now, this is what I'm, the question is, what exactly do you want your agent adapt? And then you need to say, okay, these are the time scales I need for that feature in the environment. I want my artificial agent adapt. And then it's exactly, remember this uh, picture which I showed you earlier, the complexity matching between environment and brain. Then you have again, a complexity matching of the st uh, st uh, stochastic structure of the time scales of the spontaneous activity of the agent and the stochastic structure. Of the environment. So it's really a complexity matching process. That's why it's really important to include the environmental context in the modeling of your agent because that gives you the goal, the purpose to with which it should interface. And I would deconstruct, of course, no wonder you already know all that environmental context in terms of timescales. Now, what are the timescales in artificial agents good for? Why on earth not of do you want to build artificial agents with time scales? Is it just scientific playing or is it just curiosity or does it have a specific purpose? The latter, and I tell you why. So when you have here, this is a, a good example. You have a biological agent, you have an artificial agent, and this is quite well illustrated. You have a certain larger array of time scales. That allows you a more broader perception or a more specific perception and a more specific decision making. Now, why do I want that? Because as a psychiatrist, I'm dealing with mental disorder, like schizophrenia, depression, anxiety, bipolar, post-traumatic stress disorder, and I can continue for this. And we currently do not really have biomarkers, meaning diagnostic markers. So Diagnosis is sort of guessing based on some list uh, scales, uh, but we don't really have markers like in other uh, biomarkers, like in other medical disciplines. And that also means that therapy is guided by trial and error. You have to try out, maybe this drug work, maybe cognitive behavioral therapy works. This. So we do not really have uh, a clear biomarker, nor really precision therapy. So the question is, how could we, uh, uh, change that. So that's a real issue and the mental health uh, problems are increasing. So, and most of these psychiatric disorders show specific temporal disturbances. I give you the example of depression. In depression, people experience themselves as too slow. They're lagging behind. And the whole brain, showed in various studies, is indeed literally too slow. So that's why you experience yourself as too slow relative to the faster environment. Your visual perception is too slow. Your movements are too slow, psychomotor retardation. Your thoughts are too slow. You can all show this. So the speed, so depression is primarily a speed disturbance. So then the question is, and I remember, I tell you very typically, one of my patients was a young girl, 16 year old, she came with her mother. Her mother was speaking normal speed. And the young girl didn't speak at all, nothing. She was completely, as we say, mute. So I said, woof, what is this? So it turned out to be a pure depression, no neurological disorder. And later I asked her, why didn't you speak at all? She said, my mother, I knew that my mother was speaking normal, but for me, it was too fast. I couldn't follow. That's why I shut up, because her inner time was too slow relative to the outer time. And that's what you literally see in these patients. Now, how can you treat that? Keep that in mind. Now I show you an example, and then I will come back. So the idea, what would be uh, great to do, and maybe we can even do it together 
in collaboration with the Armenian University of Armenia, if you're interested in, in uh, my institute here, that we build a particular robot with different time scales. Let me show you this one. So this is a robot, obviously, and this is a real robot. One of my former students actually built it, uh, a real robot. And what you want, you build in different time scales into the thing. So when you listen to music, you have different time scales. You have fast time scales, very short time scale, longer time scale. And these different time scales are very intricately built into each other. That makes the complexity of music. Listen to Bach, listen to Kachatoyan. I don't need to tell you as Armenians, uh, Kachatoyan has very complex layers of different time scales in his music. So now, now imagine, so you expose this robot. Uh, your robot has only one time scale. Uh, to the complexity of the music. So if the robot has only uh, fast time scales, longer time scales, yeah, here meaning only the uh, fast time scales, the robot will always dance too fast to the music. Now, if your robot has only the longer time scales, but not the shorter ones, it will always be too slow. So you want to build a robot with a variety of different time scales, which it can match with the time scales of the music. That will dance to the rhythm. Remember my rhythm example to the music. Remember the surfer. If the surfer has more time scales, it can better align to the different time scales of the wave. Same here. Now, if you're depressed, sort of your time scales are more shifted towards the longer end. It doesn't look like this. But the faster time scales, you can literally see this in the brain, are a little bit decreased, so you cannot react to fast stimuli. Your sensitivity to react to faster stimuli is hugely decreased in depression, in your perception, as well as in your brain. We could demonstrate this. So now what you want in depression, you want an agent, an artificial agent or robot, which can dance with uh, the patient in a time scale which is slightly faster than the time scale of the depressed patient, but can still, where the depressed patient can still follow. So ideally you want, as I like to speak of a temporally augmenting agent, you want a temporally augmenting agent with particular uh, shifts the depressed, very slow time scale towards slightly faster time scale, and then a gradually towards faster. We, with our vast array of different time scales, will have problems of specifically targeting that time scale which, to which the depressed patient is still responsive to, but which is, uh, pulls him also pushes him away from the very slow state. So my hope is that such temporally uh, augmenting agent can really enhance in a very individualized precision-based way the time scales in, for instance, depressed patient in for instance, music therapy and dance therapy. So here, because if you can build in specific time scales, you can really specify and uh, zoom into the, exactly that time scale which is needed for, for instance, the depressed patient. So that's, for instance, one application, and I would be very happy if we could work on this together. So now, of course, the million dollar question, can robots and AI exhibit consciousness. So for those uh, you probably know, some of you may know, uh, when in Soviet times there were in the West the Radio Yerevan jokes, and uh, in principle, yes, uh, there were always questions, can you get a car? In principle, yes, but you have to wait for 10 or 20 years. So now here I uh, have the same approach, but disclaimer, it's not a joke what I'm saying. So can robots and I have consciousness in principle? Yes. However, that will take time to build in the various time scales. Look at the human brain. It took a long evolution to develop all these time scales. And yesterday I had a discussion with uh, one of my students and I think he justifiably said, it's not just the time scales, it's the physiology behind the time scales, because these time scales, you need energy. The brain is a hugely energy demanding organ. It, it's only 2% of the weight of the body, but it consumes 20% of 
the energy. And energy, as we know, particularly in these days, it's important. So, and then this 20% the energy consumes of the body energy is 95% is invested into its spontaneous activity. So when you have task and when you see me and do all these movements, your brain will just incrementally increase its energy consumption by 5%. The rest is ongoing energy. So what on earth does the brain with all this metabolic energy, it sustains its time scales and its vast repertoire. So you see there's a very intricate interface between physiological uh, uh, metabolic energy and the time scales. And we haven't really fully understand that connection yet. So that's really, really important. Uh, but in principle, I would say, I hope that we can build in agents with specific time scales. Whether they have consciousness or not is a second question. So with that, I'm closing. So I hope I could give some ideas how consciousness, uh, what consciousness is, how consciousness is yielded by the brain, and how that provides some lesson and maybe ideas for uh, artificial agents. As I said, ideally, I would love to have a temporally augmenting agent. And that really can be subsumed under the umbrella of what we developed here in our group, the temple spatial theory of consciousness. And as you already uh, know, waves are important. That's why I titulated my, uh, titled my last uh, book, which just came out, Neurowaves, Brian, Time and Consciousness. And as in physics, time is key. There's nothing special about consciousness. We don't need to invoke a mind, some special uh, facilities of functions in the brain. It's a basic dynamic process. Look into the waves of the world and you understand what happens in the brain and consciousness. Thank you very much. Yes, question. Hello. Hi, I want to ask you a question that I was for. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I, I can barely understand you. Maybe you can come closer or something. It's I, I didn't really capture what you said. Okay, let me start again. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I think a little better, yeah. Okay, so it seems like for centuries we have been trying to make nature to build stuff. And now we're trying to make robots that are imitating the human brain, how the human work. It seems like we have been studying how the human brain works for centuries, and now we are using all that knowledge to build a robot that's an imitation of us. And I want to know why we have that desire to imitate ourselves. Oh, that's really difficult for me to capture. Uh, I'm um, sorry, can sorry you please, like, come here and talk, and he will hear. Yeah, yeah, may, yeah. I can understand you much better. Yeah, great. Thank you. Just one second. Okay, okay. <laughs> it's a longer second. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, hello. Hello. Yeah, I can hear you very okay. well. <laughs> okay, so I'm repeating the question for the third time. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, when we look back in our history, we have been uh, building stuff that are imitations of nature. Mm -hmm. And now we're trying to create robots that are the imitation of us. And we have been studying uh, the, how the human brain works for centuries. And now we're using that knowledge to imitate ourselves. I want to know why you have that desire. Okay. Um, I think you, you capture a very nice point, learning from nature. And uh, we haven't fully understood nature yet, uh, biology and dynamics. And dynamics is a key feature of nature, absolutely. 
So whether I want to imitate the brain, I don't think so. Um, and by the way, nature imitates itself. And by imitation, you get mutations. And by mutations, you get evolution. So imitation is a very basic process of nature. And it's also in our psychological repertoire. We imitate uh, the little baby, uh, imitate the mother. And by that it learns, and then it integrates it into its own spontaneous activity. And by that it develops as an individual. So imitation is a basic natural process. Um, my key is, of course, I'm fully aware of the dangers of artificial intelligence. And actually we're just uh, together with uh, Taiwan and Germany, we submitted a bigger grant on the cultural implications and relevance of artificial intelligence. So meaning the cultural perception might be different in the East slash in Taiwan and in the West, let's particularly here in the Anglo-American world. Yeah, so there's a definitely a cultural context to it, of course, because we are all environmentally context dependent. And you see that's also in my plea for agent. And there is also from the European Union, which just uh, yesterday was in the news, that they want to restrict, uh, make clear guidelines for productive use of AI versus uh, destructive use. Yeah. So I'm completely go with that. However, uh, one should not throw out the baby with the bathwater. And that means um, uh, taking out the disadvantages. And I put out one potential area. I indicated that very clearly, I think, in my psychiatric example at the end, that we can use these robots also in a very constructive way. And that's exactly what I try to indicate, that you have to work on both sides. For instance, ChatGPT was uh, not allowed in, uh, in Italy. So my Italian students are officially not, officially not allowed to use it. Um, yeah, I think that's a boundary we need to delineate and demarcate. I hope that provides an answer to your question in some way. Okay, thank you. We have here a question. Uh, it says, could you briefly explain once more the nature of depression in the viewpoint of time lapses? It's in the chat, the question. Yeah, okay. Um, so depression, so when you ask these patients, uh, they're too slow. They feel too slow. Um, their movements are too slow. They cannot get up in the morning. Their mood, nothing changes. Yeah, their thoughts don't change. It's always the same thought. It's called rumination. Their perception is very static, very dynamic. And you see exactly this kind of slowness also in the brain. The brain is literally too slow. Where is that coming from? We currently do not know. Probably it is related to some, uh, now more for the experts, for some uh, biochemical modulations by, for instance, serotonin, which comes from subcortical regions to cortical regions. But again, it's not just serotonin, it's a whole balance. But it is clear, there are strong findings that the whole brain is too slow. It's shifted towards these uh, midline regions where your sense of self is. Remember in the meditation, I explained that these regions in the middle of the brain uh, are too strong, too slow. Uh, your self is too slow. You always focus on the self and everything is negative. Yeah, the exact causes of that remain yet unclear. I hope that provides an answer to the question as it is wanted. Hi, can I ask a question? Yeah. Hi, um, I was wondering whether this uh, misalignment between time scales uh, uh, is also observed in other psychiatric disorder, like for instance, an hyperactive person, is, is it like a faster than the environment or other kinds of psychiatric disorder like addiction or uh, hyper anxiety and so on? Thank you. Yeah, good question. So. You, you open a can of worms because this is my one of my favorites. We call it spatial temple psychiatry. So you have in different psychiatric disorders, different temple disorders. So I indicated, so depression is a speed disorder. Another disorder which we investigate a lot is schizophrenia. <clears throat> so schizophrenia, it's a temple imprecision. You have in milliseconds. For instance, a recent study by ours and 
confirmed by many others, really shows that they cannot synchronize with external inputs. Yeah, they're, 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 the rhythm of their brain doesn't really can align to the rhythm of the external stimuli. Now for the expert, it's done in auditory oddball paradigms. So you see decreased what is called inter-triphase coherence. So, and this is all because the, the phase, the, the activity shifts in a temporally imprecise in milliseconds, which was shown uh, in a recent paper by one of my other students, Stefan Lechner in Vienna. Uh, he invented a very clever new methodology to measure the spontaneous uh, millimeter shifts in the activity of the brain. And that's highly increased in schizophrenia. So, and I could go on. So different disorders have different kind of temporal disturbances and that reverberates throughout the whole brain and they're different. If you want to know more about it, read our stuff on spatial temporal psychopathology as we call it. Yeah. Thank you. Welcome. Hello, Professor. Hello. Hi. Um, Hello. Um, uh, thank you for the presentation. And um, I have a question. Uh, so basically, from what from my understanding of AI, the, the simplest way to explain how it works is, and correct me if I'm wrong, you give it, you give it uh, an environment of data and then what it does it just kind of studies the relationships between you know inputs outputs and then that way if you give it your own input you it can just get you another output based on the on the on the environment you gave it and if i if i try to make the analogy with how the brain works i think it's missing two things which is making its own environment which is the equivalent of the experiences that you know a human goes through you just make your own you know your own experience which is make your own environment and the second thing is is the resting state the brain the brain's resting state so the question the questions are do we understand the resting state enough to reproduce it in an ai you know model you know that basic that basic uh uh, intrinsic activity and then if we add to it the ability to create their own environment which is have their own experience and then what the AI already has is to just go further and then basically maybe we could have a conscious AI so is that possible? Yeah um, good question highlights some of the key issues I think um, AI is very good in capturing some of what goes inside in the brain what is called cognition However, the brain lacks exactly what you described and what I try to point out the alignment. And let me specify that. So the AI passively receives the input. The AI has no chance of shaping the input and selecting the input it wants to receive. Maybe selecting, but it cannot shape the input. Yeah, so it is this active shaping of the input, which is key in the brain, for instance, if I have only slow time scales, I will not be able to process fast inputs different from slow inputs. So my time scales actively shape and select the input I can receive and process or not. This active process is philosophically, this goes against a human like view of the brain, which is very still prevalent in current neuroscience. Yeah, there is one line of research which is active sensing. Schröder and Lakatos wrote fantastic papers on that. And that goes, it's this active selection, this active shaping of the input. Yeah, and that seems to be also abnormal in mental disorders. And for that, the brain seems to use a time scale and its spontaneous activity. So what uh, he described, what we measure as a resting state. Spontaneous or resting state activity is basically when you don't perform a specific task, like watching me or listening to me or talking. Yeah, but in a way, the brain is never in rest. There's uh, always something going on. And, uh, and that indeed, I would argue that this uh, resting state, spontaneous activity is a key feature uh, of the, as a brain. For instance, we do now a lot of computational modeling uh, um, and we often discuss, and the border is always that these computational models 
do not have a spontaneous activity. So that's, we often come to that part and say, damn, we can't really model it because the spontaneous activity in the model is not there. So there you see that's the point. And indeed, I would argue that your agents need to have a spontaneous activity, independent of external input. That's a key feature. I didn't go into that spontaneous activity business so much, but that's exactly the point. Because this spontaneous activity has all these different timescales. It's a repertoire of timescales. The actual task is just, okay, tapping into one of these repertoires. It's like, say, your living room has 20 different window sizes, uh, and now you decide to look specifically through one window size and see the tree. Yeah, now, but then you can also decide, look through all windows, then you see the whole forest. But if you have only two windows, then you don't have a much of a selection. That's what your spontaneous activity, from my point of view, is good for. And that repertoire, I think, is missing. That what is called dynamic repertoire is missing. The spontaneous dynamic repertoire is missing in the age. Professor Otto, um, thank you for the illuminating talk. I want to, to give you an opportunity to expand on an idea. I know you have many things to say. And uh, let me give you a bit of context. We nowadays, of course, ask, is AI conscious? Can AI do this that the human brain can? And we end up comparing our consciousness with AI's mental abilities, artificial mental abilities. However, we know that there is a big difference between the neural constitution and functioning that the brain has and the underlying architecture of the AI. So my question would be, What's specific about the brain's properties, neural properties, and your functioning in time that create time scales and a certain number of time scales? Because then, as you and I, I suppose, um, Yasir mentioned the thing about the, the energy constraints. Of course, there will be certain trade offs in devising agents, right? As number of units, volume of connectivity, uh, transmission speed of information. And these are all key factors in constructing the time, time scales that the brain does. However, in AI, it's a different story, as the in silico constitution uh, enables different physical properties and evolution in time. Could you expand a bit on this difference in constructing time scales? Ah, uh, that's, that's a good question and a very difficult one because uh, indeed, so energy is indeed required and uh, Philip pointed that out. So when we discussed that yesterday in a meeting, you need energy and you need biology and you need physiology. And I think he's right. But then the question, what on earth is the brain using all this energy, the metabolic energy uh, and the physiology. Yes, for time scales, but how does it construct the time scales? And that's where Yazir is coming in. And Samira, who do the computational modeling in my group, we simply don't know. As far as I know, now we're trying to investigate. So yesterday I just saw data where we really show that the uh, excitatory to excitatory connection have a huge impact on your time scales. Yeah, that's of course computational modeling. You can do the, you cannot do this in imaging. So indeed, probably, and that's a very good uh, taken point here, that I think that indeed the subcellular cellular level uh, and how that yields time scales, um, because there must be, let's say, the brain uh, has excitatory cells. Uh, pyramidal cells and inhibitory cells, uh, interneurons. Uh, and that balance is key. If you change that balance, you probably change your time scales. But we are not really clear about that. Uh, how that relation goes from the excitation inhibition balance, as it calls, to the time scales. Then, of course, now as an engineer who tries, okay, Nortov tells us to construct some time scales, now we put in some time scales. Then, of course, the question arises, do we really need this balance between excitatory and inhibitory neurons, excitation and inhibition, to construct time scales? Is that a necessary feature to yield time scales or not? Because no doubt, excitation inhibition balance is in all species, not just the human brain thing. 
Uh, it's a basic feature that nature invented that. Um, I, I cannot really answer that question, but that's exactly the direction. As I said yesterday, we just raised when I saw those data, uh, how are these time scales constituted? They are an emergent phenomenon from the cellular uh, level. Of course, I would agree. Yazir would smile because I contradicted yesterday. And um, but we really don't know. Yeah, but that could probably be the bridge between physiology and the time scale stuff. How and that question will be key for implementing time scales in robot. Thank you, thank you. We have one more question in the chat. Uh, one second, we have two questions. Actually, one of them is, uh, as human develops their consciousness, adapts the time scales by noticing their breath, following the audio instruction, how do you think AI will develop their consciousness? Okay, can can you read again? Or maybe I can. I, I should be able to see it myself here because. I yes, sure. It. I can uh, read it again. Okay. As okay, human... okay. Okay. Do you well, see it? I okay. Uh, as human develops their conscious adapted time scale by noting their breaths. Is that what you mean? Following the audio instruction, how do you think AI will develop their time scales? That's the question. Yeah, I think. Uh, yes, okay. Yes. Um, yeah, interesting point. So indeed, breathing. Of course, breathing has certain time scales, and the breathing time scales connect with the brain. And actually, we're just doing uh, this is done by Josh uh, Gohen in my uh, group uh, a larger study on breathing and anxiety. And the main, uh, what we seek so far in the pilot data is indeed that there is a certain information, dynamic information shared between the breathing time scales and the brain time scales. So the working assumption here is really that the more the breathing and the, and the brain time scales are shared, the less anxiety. So maybe anxiety, that's sort of what we also see in the data, is about the desynchronization of the time scales of the brain from the body, from the breathing. And that induces uncertainty because you cannot predict the next breathing thing and anxiety is exactly that it's temple uncertainty you do not know what happens in the next time point and you get nervous and anxious that sort of and the breathing therapy as, as astoundingly helps very well in almost every single subject we have seen uh, so far yeah so indeed here what I said for the environment and the brain also applies to the body and uh, the brain. Similar thing, heart and brain, there's a lot of studies on that synchronization too. Thank yeah. you. And we have one last question here also mentioned, please. Do you see it or I can read it for you? Yeah, so I see I see one hand up here by Kaiser Saad and I see one question in the chat. Yeah. And I can, what shall I start with? Okay, I Did read in the chat. It? Okay, so hello, uh, there's quite a lot of literature on why humans perceive timbre of a particular sound as a whole and how they dissect it into partial with their oral abilities. It obviously has to do with zooming in and out. Yet there's very little on why is it possible to perceive all of the different polyrhythm in an episode of mu music as an organic whole. So my question is, how do the time scales align to the polyrhythm? I think this is a very good question. And remember, so thank you for the question. And my partner is a musician, a composer, so as an for years from Armenia. And so we often discuss these, these issues. Um, indeed. So imagine music and polyrhythm. What is polyrhythm? You have different time scales. And remember, man, uh, remember my example with the thief and the and 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 and, and the police guy. Yeah, uh, that there you have you need fine-grained time scales to see where the fine-grained changes uh, in shorter time windows. But you also need uh, larger time scales, longer time scales to put some of that together. So in the polyrhythm, I expect that you probably exploit a lot of your repertoire of different time scales. And if you do not have the longer time scales or they are very weak in you, you have probably difficulties of putting all these polyrhythm together into one organic whole meaning you will perceive the piece in a different way. So ideally, I would like to do an experiment here. Basically, 
I look at the your polyrhythmic music piece, and I look at the different rhythm, and I deconstruct it in terms of time scales. That's the first step. Then I go to my subjects, investigate their brain in the resting state without listening to the polyrhythmic piece yet, and then I look whether the time scales of the piece, let's say, and you can measure that in terms of autocorrelation window in the piece itself, autocorrelation now, this is more for the experts now. And then you can measure the same time scales with the same measure slash autocorrelation window in the brain of the individual subject. And ideally, if I'm right, I should basically from the time scales in my brain, I should predict how they will perceive in what gradient they perceive the different rhythms in your polyrhythmic piece based on the gradients of the corresponding time scales in the brain. Whether they perceive the faster rhythm of the polyrhythmic stronger relative to the slower, or they perceive the slower stronger to the fast, because that should be related to corresponding time scales in the brain. If you perceive the slower uh, rhythmic pieces of your polyrhythmic uh, pieces stronger, then I expect that you have more stronger, uh, uh, longer time scales in the brain corresponding to faster, and of course, vice versa. So then I should have basically have a readout. And that's very important then also to construct my individual agent. Yeah. So then I will try to, if I have a readout of my individual subject time scales, and that predicts the perception of that subject, uh, let's say of the music piece, remember my, my uh, last example, then I can tailor the robot uh, time scales accordingly for the therapeutic use. You have got, Nick, uh, we have a question here. Just one second, please. Uh, hello, Professor. Thank you very much for the wonderful lecture. Uh, I'm a computer science student and I have a, maybe a naive question on the concept of time scales. So I believe for some time in the field of neuroscience, there is this ongoing search for some kind of quality quantitative measure or benchmark of consciousness like how much more conscious is a person asleep than a person under an anesthesia or something like that then uh, like you illustrated in one of the slides uh, can the amount of how well the environment time scales and brain time scales are aligned can that serve as some kind of a, a reliable qualitative measure and can we uh, come up with a similar measure for AI, given a specific architecture is implemented? Yeah, um, good question. So if you want to in, uh, include the timescales in your devices, I'm happy to work with you together. So my idea would be really, uh, remember my example of the polyrhythmic music. So basically, because I assume that you have a correspondence between the timescales of your environmental input the time scales of your device slash agent slash brain and the time scales of your perception. So we call that common currency. Yeah. So that's shared. And the more you share the time scales of your brain with the environment, the more you will perceive the time scales in the environment. So for me, the lacking piece, so because basically remember, that's why I want to have basically a readout from the time scales of the brain for your consciousness, for your perception. Yeah, and that is my job and, I, and we're working on that. But if I can do that, then I can come back to you and say, build in those and those time scales in your device. And then I can predict how that agent will be able to interact with my specific person and its perception. Mm -hmm. I hope that addresses the question. And I, I'm really serious. I wouldn't know because I'm not an engineer. I'm not a computer scientist how to build in these time scales. I mean, there are measures like autocorrelation window, uh, permutation entropy. We're currently just, Andrea Buccellati from my good in Italy um, uh, adopts that. We're also linking the excitation inhibition balance to time scales. Uh, Samira is doing that in my group. So we try to address some of those gaps, which I think could be relevant also for you as a computer scientist. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Yeah, so if somebody of you guys are interested in that, I'm very open. Yeah. We have Taser set. I think we can also have her to 
Yes. Hello, Dr. Nortov. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Hello. Yeah, I, I just, yes, uh, okay, thank you. I uh, just, I want, uh, I would like to stop on articular point because, okay, we are speaking from biological and uh, cellular human perspective about the consciousness. What about our, our other, another type of consciousness which we can't detect, we can't understand, or we can't um, assess? Um, there is potential for artificial intelligence to go out of our understanding for consciousness and our rules, because uh, even our um, we are even with our understanding to our consciousness. We are still in the beginning. So, what about another type, another state, another that, another um, another method of processing and another rules of mm -hmm. consciousness? Which can we, which out of our uh, abilities, our uh, for assessment or understanding? Um, yeah, I mean, you saw that I try to go beyond the human species. That I included some other species like plants and also other biological animals. biological brains. Um, our not brain, sorry, biological back by, from. We are just reflecting ourselves in different states or in different um, uh, layers. But I mean, what about totally different type of consciousness with different, which out of our, um, we are not reflecting different okay. type of consciousness. Um, if you want to go beyond biology, you want mm. to go to the spiritual realm, it sounds like. No, um, metaphysics, not spiritually, metaphysical, something which we can't assess with our tools, like our mental or our consciousness. Yeah, fair. I mean, I mentioned, for instance, the example of plants, which we yeah. cannot perceive. The It was an initial example of that. But of course, you seem to be much more radical. So I think I, I cannot say anything at this point in time because we have no evidence for that. But I can't exclude it either because of our limitations. Um, so, and I think I clearly pointed out the limitations because, of course, the dog has more fine-grained uh, timescales for smell than us. So they perceive the world in a much more fine-grained uh, smelling uh, way than we can. Yeah, and that's absolutely okay. And I think it's a gradual point. I think the point, what is behind that, and I agree with that, that we should not fall back into an anthropocentrism. And saying, and then also uh, uh, what I call the argument of specialness, that our consciousness and brain is special. There's, and I think I pointed out that it's not. It's just basic dynamical principles of nature. We just haven't understood that yet. And what is the metaphysics of today might be the science of tomorrow. So I definitely agree with that. And I think we can learn as well. The question of rules <clears throat> which you addressed it's of course a difficult one. When you try to go into computational modeling, um, you need rules, you need mathematical formalisms. And I would argue that, and you, you, you saw that we really go strongly rely on dynamic systems theory and dynamic systems theory doesn't come from neuroscience. It doesn't, it comes from biology. It comes even from physics and chemistry. Yeah, so, and we do a lot of, uh, uh, try to really look into these fields, into physics, biology, engineering. Um, these are sort of the key fields where we look, uh, and of course, mathematics, um, where we get a lot of inspiration. So we try really to conceive the human brain and the brain in general in this wider context. So I think that's extremely important also to really avoid an anthropocentrism and much of the consciousness debate in current neuroscience is clearly pre-Copernican. I mean, you see in some books of mine, I, I speak for the need of a Copernican turn or post-Copernican view or Copernican revolution, if you want to say so. And that's clearly true. And that's a problem in neuroscience. It's very pre-Copernican, uh, very central, very anthropocentric, even if they go to the uh, animals, because they still take the humans as a reference. Yeah. Mm. I agree with that. Mm -hmm, yeah. Yeah, this is yeah, this is a point which we are just taking what we know as reference. But even um, as artificial intelligence can use physics, which we didn't understand or we, we didn't know yet. Right. 
right. It Definitely. Can, yeah. It can yeah. happen. I mean, yesterday I was confronted with quantum computing. So mm. maybe the quantum computing allows you a, sick, a kind of signal processing, which we cannot do with the current computers. I said, wonderful. If it allows to process the signal in a more complex way, maybe we find something in the brain. Yeah, a complexity, background activity, which is now considered noise and cancelled out and we cannot capture. Absolutely. I'm all for it. I'm way too much of a scientist and too curious also to close the, the doors for that. Okay. It's the opposite. Yeah. And that's the way I also see AI. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I see that as a, uh, to a deeper layer to better understand the deeper layer. For instance, if we have a deep learning model, mm -hmm. yeah, we have a deep learning model. And now let's say we have a deep learning model with uh, timescales and one deep learning model without timescales. Now I fit in my raw data uh, from my brain imaging data into these two models. Now, if my deep learning model with timescales predict my brain data better yeah. than the deep learning model without timescales, yeah, bingo. Yeah, mm -hmm. there mm -hmm. you see that would give me a retrospective support. Okay, these timescales are important in my data because they're better predicted by the deep learning model with time scale. You see, I would really like to see that implemented by computer scientists or engineers. So that's why I'm very open to collaboration. So that's the way I see it. The same way where I see this temporally augmenting agent, yeah, to highlight specific time scales and use it for the therapy in my psychiatric patients. Okay, Dr. George, thank you very much. Thank you.